charge against God's elect people. It is God who acquits them, who is going to condemn them. It is Christ Jesus who died, even more, who was raised, and who also is at God's right hand. It is Christ Jesus who also pleads our case for us. Who will separate us from Christ's love? Will we be separated by trouble or distress or harassment or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, we are being put to death all day long for your sake. We are treated like sheep for slaughter. But in all these things, we win a sweeping victory through the one who loved us. I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord, nor death, or life, nor angels or rulers, not present things or future things, not powers or height or depth, or any other things that is created.
that Jacob would later repeat for himself at his confirmation. This Lenten season, we are going to remember those baptismal vows that we have either made for ourselves or that someone who loved us very much made for us. We don't have as much opportunity to hear baptismal vows here at Hubbard as we would like, but they are an important covenant that we make with God and before God and with our church community. And it is because we don't often hear them that I am particularly excited to have our worship during this season of Lent focus on these vows. I believe it will be a good reminder for all of us of the covenant we have made with God and with the community that we are a part of. Because we don't have baptisms every week or every month here, you might be surprised as we work our way through these vows how much these vows speak directly to the issue of justice and our willingness to embrace justice for all people, to work for justice to happen and to reject injustice, evil, and oppression in all of its forms. So even as we focus on our baptismal vows, we will also be hearing again a call to justice. And it is this call to justice found in our baptismal vows that I believe makes this series so appropriate for the season of Lent. Justice is always a difficult subject, sometimes a painful subject, because the idea of justice and the practices of injustice are never things that are out there somewhere that only concern other people. In order to address justice issues, we have to be willing to look inside ourselves. Lent is a season of repentance, and any call to justice requires that we first look inward to see where we have failed, where we have allowed apathy or ignorance to hinder our working for justice, where we ourselves may have been unjust or have been a part of systems of injustice that hurt other people. And believe me, I understand that this can be painful work. These are sometimes painful sermons for me to work on because I have to face myself before I can ever speak a word to any of you. Repentance and becoming just people are works that take place deep in our spirits oftentimes too deep for words. And I am really grateful for the work of our choir, for the work of our musicians and the musicians who have composed the music that we will share this season. Because as many of you know, music has the ability to take us places within ourselves that words alone cannot. In order to even begin or approach this Lenten work of repentance, I believe we have to be absolutely clear on who we are. And that is one of the first things that happens when we are baptized. We are named and we are claimed. Remember the story of Jesus' baptism? When he came up out of the water, immediately we are told. The heavens opened and a dove descended and then the voice of God spoke. And that voice said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. In those words, Jesus received from his Father acceptance, this is my Son, affection, whom I love, and affirmation. With him I am well pleased. <clears throat> now believe it or not, and I still find this amazing, God feels the same way about each one of us. Is that not amazing? I can remember the first time that somebody told me that. I was actually in seminary when I began to understand that. I was sitting in a class on leadership of all things, and there was a visiting pastor who was there speaking to us that day. And I was in the front row, the way I usually was, because I wasn't going to miss anything. And I was in the front row of that class, and he said that. He said, God feels the same way about us as he did about Jesus at his baptism. God accepts us, God loves us, and God affirms us. 
And you know, my first reaction to those words was to want to scoop my chair back in case lightning struck. Because I thought he was speaking words of blasphemy. That was not the way I had been raised. And I thought, surely this is not going to end well in this classroom. And then when lightning failed to arrive, then I thought, I'm sure that the professor is going to kind of, you know, step in and gently correct this theology that he's spreading here and, and let him know that, you know, Jesus is certainly more loved and more affirmed and more accepted than we are. I mean, Jesus is the Son of God. And much to my surprise, the professor walked over right at that moment and he said, I want you to hear what he just said. And he repeated those same claims. Well, I had to go home and do a lot of thinking about that. I did a lot of Bible reading about that to find out who was wrong, them or me. And it was me. <laughs> All of the preaching that I have listened to, at least what I had heard or what I had internalized, had not led me to understand that God felt that way about me. But what else can the Bible mean when the Bible says we are God's own children? Now I wonder how many of us feel kind of like the black sheep of God's family. I have felt like that sometimes. How many of us are so much more aware of our faults, or if we're feeling positive, we say our growing edges, than we are about our gifts and how God delights in us. I remember a baptism that I did a while back. It was a family baptism of two grandchildren of someone who attends here. And it was at their lake home. And there was a little girl and a little boy. And we did the baptism outside. And the little boy, I remember, wasn't real sure about having me come anywhere close to him. And he didn't really care for the water being poured over his head either. But the little girl had a ball with her baptism. She was absolutely delighted. And I remember after the baptism was done and I set the bowl of water on this table, this low table that was sitting out there, she went over and she kept dipping in the water and pouring it over her head over and over again until her hair was drenched, her face was wet, her dress was soaked. She was baptized from head to toe by the time she got done. And then when all that was done, she took the pacifier out of her mouth and dipped it in the water and put it back on their baptism the way that little girl did. Now, I know that she wasn't old enough to understand what was happening to her through that baptism. But I watched her do that, and I remember praying that she would never lose her delight in being a part of God's family, that she would be raised to understand just how wonderful it was to be baptized that day. And I was so glad to see so many family members taking pictures of her, continuing to baptize herself after, after our service was done so that she can remember that moment as she gets older. I thought about that baptism as I was preparing this sermon and I thought, if all of us, if all of us really understood the love and the acceptance and the affirmation that we are given as we are baptized, we might all want to walk around wet with the water of our baptism dripping off of us. I was talking with a young pastor the other day, and she said, when I think of my baptism, I think of being called to walk wet into this world, full to overflowing with God's love and God's grace. Now, I don't think it's by accident that this particular pastor is devoting much of her time and energy to work that, around, that uh, centers around justice. It is when we understand how totally God accepts us and how deeply God loves us that we develop a desire for all people to have that same understanding. Our baptism and all that comes with it according to our scriptures, assures us that we are not anonymous people living lives of futility in this world. No, we are children of Almighty God. We have a name and we have a family, and who we are is of great importance to God. And then, 
I believe we come to understand or to realize that all people are just this important to God. As much as we hear about people being categorized and prioritized and judged and exploited, we understand that every single person in this world is a unique individual, someone with a name that is known to God, someone who is utterly important to God. And that, I believe, is what inspires any work that we do for justice. For everyone born into this world, God has either already accepted them into the family or is waiting to welcome them. And that is where our justice work begins. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. Last Wednesday night at our Ash Wednesday service, uh, Pastor Lori Nielsen from Riverside told this story about a young pastor who initiated a very painful moment in his congregation when he dressed as a homeless person and laid on the grass in the yard of the church and waited to see how his congregation would react to that. It didn't go well. But Centennial United Methodist Church in Mankato, Minnesota, has a deacon, the same one that I spoke of earlier, who said that she walks wet into the world, Erica Jo Kozer. And Erica Jo discovered that there is a large homeless population in Mankato. And she also discovered that the homeless shelter, which cannot provide beds for all of the people who are homeless, but the ones who, who do find rest there, that homeless shelter closes at 7 o'clock in the morning. And there is nowhere warm for those people to go until 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. And so she talked to people within her church, and they have started this program called Breakfast Church serving the homeless population of Mankato. Six days a week, they feed over 100 people who are homeless a hot meal that is sure to have some source of protein in it so it will stay with them until lunch. A lot happens in that church between those hours when breakfast church happens. There is a lot of food given out. There is a lot of prayers that are lifted up and there is a lot of grace that is shown. Some of these people struggle with mental illness. Many of them struggle with addictions. Almost all of them are intensely lonely. But over the last couple of years, this homeless population in Mankato has discovered that there is a place within the city that cares about them, a place that will not judge them, a place that simply offers that hot food <coughs> and grace. Every once in a while, Erica said, they discover somebody sleeping uh, right in front of the door of their church on the cement out there. And there's one person, she said, in particular that she'll find in that spot. And if they've thrown out any boxes into their recycling bin uh, at the end of the day, they'll find that he's taken those boxes apart and he's laying on them and covering himself up with those boxes. And she asked him one morning when she came in, she said, why do you choose to sleep here? Surely there have to be more comfortable places in the city than the hard, cold cement outside our front door. And he said to her, I come here because I know I'm safe here. The police won't bother me here because they know that you're okay with me being here. And if I sleep too long and I'm still here when you come in the morning, I know that I'll be woken up gently. And it was that last sentence that really got to me. I know I'll be woken up gently. I don't think that there's much gentleness that is often shown to the homeless population. I wonder how much gentleness a homeless person experiences, but then I started to wonder how much gentleness many people in our community experience. Who are the people that I run into that are in need of a little gentleness? Every once in a while, we get a call from someone who has no place to stay for the night, and we, um, through the ministerial, we provide a hotel room for a night or two until they can work out some kind of arrangements. A couple of years ago, this congregation paid for housing for a woman and her three young children for the whole month of May so that her children could finish school before she was moved to a uh, a homeless center in another city. But we don't have a lot of contact, I don't think, with homeless people. But
But I wondered, who are the people that I come into contact with every day who simply need a gentle touch? Who are the people who need an understanding smile or a kind word or a little bit of help that I often overlook in my impatience to move fast? As I was preparing for this series, I looked up the definition of justice. Justice is a concern for fairness, peace, and genuine <coughs> respect for all people. That is the definition of justice, a concern for fairness, peace, and genuine respect for all people. I know that all of us are aware of the great justice concerns of our day, the many millions of refugees who are having to flee their homes and have nowhere to go and no place to rest their head. The many people who suffer from hunger, right now there's a famine going on that is killing thousands of people every day in certain parts of the world. People who are living in fear every day. People who are the objects of our prejudices and our biases. And, you know, we're going to have to get to some of that in this series. But sometimes justice can be as simple as noticing someone who often goes unnoticed. Offering gentleness to someone that we might otherwise take for granted. And doing what we can to help that person who is struggling right in front of us. Would you please... Pray with me. Holy and mighty God, we have all lived long enough to know that your command that we love, that we love you with all that we have, that we love our neighbor, that we love ourselves, this command is not for the faint of heart. It takes courage. It takes commitment and discipline. It takes much grace. Grant us the grace and the courage to obey this one command. Amen.